there are limitless possibilities and our minds create these limited belief systems. And when you can really step out into faith and realize that you could live beyond your wildest dreams and that anything is possible, then you're really, you're onto something. So I want to tell people who are listening, like dreams do come true. Like you can have it all. You can do whatever it is that you set your mind to, no matter where you were born, where you live, what hand you were dealt, anything is possible. It's time for the Share Recovery Podcast, where we bring you amazing life-changing success stories from addicts and alcoholics all over the world who share their inspiring journey in recovery. And now, here's your host, O. On today's episode of the Share Podcast, we have the beautiful Tara Magalski joining us. Her website is The Divine Lifestyles, and she also has a podcast called Divine Lifestyles. Professionally, Tara is a certified holistic health counselor, wellness expert, motivational speaker, author, mental health activist, and of course, the founder of Divine Lifestyles. And that is who Tara is today, but that hasn't always been the case. For almost a decade now, she has been working on becoming the person that she is today. She is the daughter of two active drug addicts, her father who is still currently out in the streets in active addiction and whose mother passed away to a prescription drug overdose. Her life spiraled so out of control that Tara actually contemplated suicide. So her amazing story doesn't come without its dramatic rock bottom moments. As a matter of fact, I don't think it's any coincidence that I had the week that I just had where I was forced to look at the disease of addiction straight in the face. There was a couple of things that happened, uh, one of which was that I interviewed Rose McKinney, the Midwestern mama, and she is the founder of Our Young Addicts. She is the mother of a drug addict. And in our interview, she takes us through her own journey of recovery through Al-Anon, through therapy, through literature. She had to do a lot of work on herself before she was able to help her son. And, and And this interview was on Wednesday. On that day, I also got a text message from one of my friends that I've known for 15 years, and she sends me a message that her son, who is a heroin addict, is on the streets and looking worse than ever. And she asked for my help, so I call my sponsor, and we start putting together an intervention. My sponsor's been cleaned for 27 years, and he's one of the co-founders of one of the treatment centers here that treats indigent drug addicts and alcoholics that basically are in the streets. Guys that don't have a shot anywhere else and can't afford high-end treatment centers. This kid's gotten to a point where he has nothing, and his mother's not in a position to financially support him. So I call my sponsor, and he says, well, he's got to be ready. He has to be ready because this is a nine-month program. Once he's in there, he's got to abide by all the rules. There is no special treatment. The place is very humble. And if he's not willing to follow all the rules, he can't get in there. So this is kind of where all the irony comes in between the interview that I had with Rose McKinney and this interview that's about to go out with Tara Magalski because we're talking about family members that are not drug addicts but are forced to cope with family members that are drug addicts. And now it's me on this end with my good friend who his son is dying in the streets. And I know that he is not 100% ready to follow all the rules and spend nine months in a rehab center. But there's no way that I can turn my back on his mother. I've just known her for too long and... You know, when I talked to her, you know, and her voice on the phone was of just absolute terror and of desperation. So at this point, I've got to do whatever it takes to get him in there. I've got to tell my sponsor that this kid is 100% ready, no questions asked. And I've got to manipulate this kid into accepting the terms of going into rehab. I've never been in an actual intervention. So I feel it's so important to discuss this because... For example, Tara's story is being the daughter of a drug addict. 
And my interview with Rose was about being the mother of a drug addict. And now here I am in the middle of an intervention with the mother of a drug addict. And so watching her and how she copes with the situation and how she's been coping with the situation all this time is, is paramount. And as we're going through this whole process, I am watching the disease of addiction 100% in action. I am for the first time on this side of the equation. I am a family member. This could be my son. This could be my daughter. And if it were, what would I do? So here are the broad strokes of what went on that day. I pick up my friend. We go to the bus station to pick him up. Once we get there, I have to be strong for her and I have to be strong for him. I have to present, I have to, I have to present myself as confident and that I'm here to help and I have all the answers. I need to portray that even though this is my first time and I really don't know what I'm doing. But I can tell you this, I was praying almost every minute of that entire day. So we pick up this kid. He looks like the, a starring cast member in the Dallas Buyers Club. I mean, he literally looks like the, the Matthew McConaughey character, but worse. So he's skin and bones. He's got this blemishes all over his face. He looks absolutely terrible. And I just walk up to him. I give him a hug. I'm like, it's great to see you. And let's get you into rehab, bro. Let's just do this. He's like, yeah, man, thank you so much. I really appreciate this. Um, I wish you didn't have to see me like this. So he realizes just how bad he looks. Anyway, so we take him, we get him some food, and while we're getting him some food, he tells me that he's got to pick up some money from his boss, who happens to be in town. I think it was all bullshit now. In hindsight, his behavior is sketchy, it's sporadic, it's obsessive-compulsive, It's just, it's making me uncomfortable. It's making me uneasy. And it just felt like there was this ominous presence all around us. Like this, the disease was surrounding all of us. And it really had its grips in this kid. So, so he's sitting at the table. He's like, I need cigarettes. I need to put money on my phone. I need to go do whatever. And we're like, look, go across the street. There's a convenience store. Just go pick up some cigarettes. He's gone for a long time. So now I'm like freaking out. So I leave the restaurant. I go down to go find him. And just as I'm getting to the convenience store, I see him getting into a cab. And I just flip the fuck out. So I call him. I'm like, hey. He actually actually answered the phone. He's like, hey, what's up? And I'm like, dude, where the fuck are you going? He's like, oh, uh, I'm on my way back to the restaurant. And I go, did you just get into a cab? He's like, yeah, my boss met me here. And and now we're going to drive over to the restaurant. And so, of course, my spider senses are tingling, but I don't want to get into it, man. Like, here is it. Here, my whole thought is he's either making a run for it or he called the dope man, which I'm pretty sure he called the dope man. So he gets back to the restaurant. He's already eaten. And he's like, hey, I got to go to the bathroom. Can I go to the bathroom before we go? I'm feeling sick from all the food. He's in the, he's in the restroom for like 15 minutes. And I'm sitting outside. We're waiting for him. I'm trying to make conversation with his, with his mother. And she's going, she looks at me and she says, do you think he's using in there? And I'm like, oh, you know what? I don't think he has the time. He might be. I don't know. I think it's safe to assume the kid was banging dope in there. Anyway, so now I've got to take him to the doctors. And it's a private physician because he doesn't have any ID. And I can't get him into the local government agencies because they require ID. So I call some friends. I make an appointment. I get this kid to see a doctor. He checks him over prescribes a methadone and then writes a letter so that I can submit it to the rehab center and they'll let him in. And now I've got to run around and try and pick up methadone. Now, for those of you that are listening clearly, I mean, seriously, it hadn't dawned on me that I'd be running around picking up a fucking relapse kit. But now I'm an autopilot. I'm just, again, my focus is to get this kid into rehab but my mind is just fucking racing and I'm talking to the doctor and I'm talking to the rehab center and I'm talking to my sponsor and it's just like, it's craziness. And so I get the prescription, we get down to the first pharmacy and they tell me, yeah, we don't have 10 milligrams, 
We don't have 10 milligrams. We have five milligrams. So, okay, I go, no problem. Just give me the five milligrams. No, the prescription needs to request five milligrams. So I'm starting to fucking lose my shit. And I call the doctor. The doctor's like, what the fuck? What's the difference? I go, I don't know. They wanted something different. So I go back to his house. He rewrites the prescription. I come back. He says, okay, great. Five milligrams. Okay, this looks good. Ah, but you have to specify how many days he's going to be using it for. So now my my level of anxiety is going through the roof. I'm starting to yell in the pharmacy. They're looking at me like a crazy person. And I remove myself before it gets really, really nasty. The bottom line here is that I'm freaking the fuck out. This is now where it's starting to get a little scary even for me. Meanwhile, every time I get out of the pharmacy, this kid who is Jones and is looking at me like, are we cool? Are we cool? And I'm like, nah, dude, sorry. I had to go back to the doctor a third time for him to put in the number of days. And so I come back to the pharmacy and they tell me, no, this doesn't compute. The number that you're asking for and the number of days, you're going to have an extra two pills. And I'm like, fuck this. And I fucking storm out of there and I said, we're going to another pharmacy. So I get to another pharmacy and thank you, God, they were able to hook me up. But by now, I am just a disaster. I'm really just like livid. And here's the best part. The best part is that this kid is under the impression that he's going to some 28-day rehab center like you see in the movies where they have TV and nice rooms and a bunch of shit that, you know, is not true. This is a nine-month program that is for indigents. It's totally a hardcore. You can't get a visitor for the first 30 days. It's <clears throat> There's no phone. There's no tablets. There's no internet. There's no nothing. You walk in with your clothes, and they give you the program. It's the real deal. And on top of that, he ain't paying for it. So take it or leave it. Anyway, somehow the the topic of how long he's going to be there comes up. And I said, yeah, well, you've got plenty of time to think about it because you'll be in there for at least 90 days. And he's like, 90 days? Nobody said anything about 90 days. I thought I was going to be in there for 28 days. What are you talking about, man? Like, I can't be in there for 28 days. And I was like, I just about put the brakes on the car and I just... I just, I just saw red. I was so angry. And I was like, look, bro, here's the deal. I have pulled strings. I have made phone calls. I have paid for your doctor's visit. I'm paying for your meds. Here's how this is going to go down. You can get out of the car right now and leave with your mom. You don't have to go anywhere. But this is as far as I go. I am done. Do not count on me for anything. Somewhere deep down inside of me, the tough love that I had, that had been indoctrinated in me since I walked into these rooms just came out. And plus, I was already just fucking tired, sick and fucking tired of this shit. So I was like, look, dude, here it is. You either agree to this or you're on your own. And then I just shut the fuck up. You know what they say. In any sales negotiation, the first one to speak loses. Okay, oh, you're right, man. Oh, God. I'm really sorry, man. I just didn't know it was going to be that long. All right, man, I'll do it. I'll do whatever you tell me, man. You think they'll have internet over there? And, uh, you know, I was thinking about writing some music and, you know, uh, maybe I can download your podcast on my iPad. And, man, I was pretty sure none of this shit was going to happen. But I was like, hey, you know what? Let's just see. When we get there, let's just see what the rules are. And we'll take it from there. How about that? All right, that's cool. So I finally get the meds. We finally get on the road. And we start heading towards the rehab center. And it is Friday night. The traffic is just absolutely ridiculous. They're waiting for me to get in there since 6 o'clock. And at this time, it's already close to 7. And by the time we get up there, it's close to eight o'clock at night we're all tired it's just like it's been too much and i know i ring on the doorbell the guy comes out the kid's outside smoking 
and the guy goes, uh, yeah, you can't smoke in here. And the kid just fucking loses his shit. He goes, let me get this straight. I'm going into rehab and I can't fucking smoke. What kind of fucking place is this? What kind of rehab doesn't let you smoke? And so the, the house manager at the time, he says, look, man, nicotine is a drug. So you can't smoke in here. That's it. That's it. I'm drawing the line. Fuck it. I'm not going in. I'm not doing this. So once again, I got to do the tough sell. And I look at him and I said, you know what? You're right, man. You don't have to do anything you don't want to do. All right. But again, like I said, the only reason why they're letting you in here in the first place is because I'm vouching for you. And the only reason why I'm vouching for you is because of your mother. I'm not doing this for you, bro. I'm doing this for your mother because I love her and I've known her for 15 years. So here's my whole deal. You either accept the terms of this deal exactly the way it is, or we are done here. More importantly, I'm done here. Well, he'd already thrown a fit. The house manager calls the director, tells him that that there's that this kid that's just trying to get in on a Friday night without being checked out by the resident physician who's got a guitar and an iPad and a cell phone and is bitching that he can't smoke. And while I'm running around like a lunatic looking for Nicorette gum for this kid, when I get back, the house manager pulls me aside and says, we can't take him tonight. You're going to have to bring him back on Monday. Now, there's no way I'm letting... A speedball using crackhead sleep in my house. It's just not going to happen. So I'm like, look, I spent eight hours with this kid. I need you to take him. We'll figure this out. He goes, sorry. I talked to the director. He doesn't want to let him in. So I call my sponsor and I'm like, look, bro, you got to help me out here, man. I cannot have this kid staying with me all weekend. All right, I went through all this to get him in here today. They were, I was told that he was going to be able to get in. He's like, all right, let me get the director on a three-way call. Now, my sponsor is one of the board members and is one of the primary financial contributors to this rehab center. So I'm counting on him to help me out here. Anyway, the director gets on the phone. The three of us are on here. And the first thing my sponsor is like, dude, tell me this kid isn't making demands. I was like, what do you mean? iPad, internet, cell phone? Come on, man. What's wrong with you? Huh? What are you getting soft on me? I was like, no, no, man, I'm not. I'm not. Then then what are you doing? Listen, tell this kid he follows the rules or he's not getting in. Period. So, I mean, I knew my sponsor was just being tough with me because he needed to be. He needed to be tough with me the way I was being tough with my friend and his son. Either this kid follows the rules or he's not going in. I'll take care of it. So I went back to him and I said, look, kid, here's the deal, man. Either you follow the rules to the letter or you're not getting in. And trust me on this. I pulled a lot of strings, asked for a lot of favors to get you in here under these circumstances. You're not getting in anywhere. Now, at this point, the kid's in tears. He's been crying all over his mom. And when I talk about kid, the guy's 30 years old. He's got two kids and has nothing to his name. He says, look, I'm done. Whatever it is, take everything. All right, I'll go in. So we get him inside. The house manager goes through his bag, starts pulling out syringes and matches and lighters and rigs and drugs. It was just off. I go, dude, seriously? He's like, well, I mean, come on, man. That's 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 how we roll, oh? I was like, yeah, man, that's how we roll. Please, I need all of it. I'm telling you, bro, if you get kicked out of here, I can't pull any more strings. And I can't help you anymore. This is the end of the road for you. He's like, I got it. I got it. So he finally surrenders and we get him in. And uh, and his mother and I drive off. And as we're driving down the road, it's a lot of silence. And finally she chimes in and she says... I'm an enabler. I go, huh? She goes, well, I just watched you deal with my son over the last eight hours or so, and I realized that I'm just a complete enabler. I could never tell him the things that you told him in the way that you told him. 
And thank you so much for doing this because I, I couldn't do it. I said, it's been a lesson for, for both of us. This is my actual first rodeo on this. So we're doing this together and we're doing the best we can. But yeah, I know as a mother, it's tough to be as tough as I'm being right now. But you have to be because who you're dealing with right there is not your son. It's a person consumed by the disease of addiction and they will lie and cheat and manipulate to get drugs, to use drugs, period. That's what, that's what we do. So I felt compelled to tell you guys this story because it was so heartbreaking for me. The adrenaline was flying all day. I wouldn't recommend this to anybody unless you've got somebody else with you. I should have had at least one more recovering addict with me. Thank God his mother was with me. And thank God I have 12 years. And thank God I was praying to God all day because I needed to lean on him big time. But the most important thing of all was that for one day, I got an opportunity to know what it was like to be Tara, to be Rose, to live in their shoes, even for just a moment. What I went through in those few hours, I wouldn't wish on anybody. The level of anxiety and stress and fear is as more than anyone should have to bear. And these two women in particular had to do that, had to endure this for years. So my message to you, to everyone who is the mother, the father, the brother, the sister of an active drug addict, reach out for help. Ask for help. My friend, she came to me and she asked for help. And I called my sponsor and Tara and Rose did the same thing. They realized that there was no way that they were going to be able to deal with what they were dealing with alone. And today, there's, there's so many ways to reach out and get help. And if you don't know where to start, just get on your knees and ask God to guide you. He absolutely, most certainly will. Thanks for letting me share. So now, we jump into Tara's story. But first, a quick message from our sponsor. Sober Nation is the largest online recovery community and treatment resource center. They provide treatment resources to those struggling with addiction, as well as to the family members who are caught in the crossfire. On top of that, Sober Nation is a huge community of good people who share their experience with each other. They have informative content, recovery and addiction news, as well as an entire clothing line which helps expand the culture of recovery. They can easily be found at www.SoberNation.com. Sober Nation is putting recovery on the map. Now back to the show. Hi, Tara. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to have you on the show today. How are you feeling? I'm feeling good. Sunday fun day. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> I love it. All right. So let's get started. So tell us a little bit about how your life is today. Just give us a, a brief you know, overview of exercise routine. I know you've got a podcast, so tell us a little bit about the podcast because I'm sure keeping that balance in your life has got to be a little bit of a challenge. So tell us a little bit about your daily routine. Yeah, that's a great question because I try and stick to a very similar consistent daily routine, which includes getting up, prayer, meditation, eating healthy, first thing in the morning, start my engine off right. I love to read. So reading and writing, if I can get that in and exercising, which is major, major, major for me. That is how I stay happy, healthy, and balanced is to <laughs> exert energy and to definitely raise some serotonin levels through exercise. Yeah. Okay. Well, you sound very energetic. So, you know, whatever you're doing, it's working. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I was just shooting a video for today, my self-care Sunday series, and I had dance today, which makes me so happy. So I try and dance three days a week. So I just came from there. So you got me pretty, uh, you got me high right now. Ooh, I love it. <laughs> Natural I love high. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your podcast. Yeah. Um, so my podcast is called Divine Lifestyles with Tara Magalski, and we talk about faith, nutrition, leadership, passion, purpose, healing, transformation. I started out really 
just really wanting to share stories of healing and transformation, you know, people's personal struggles leading into triumphs. And as I've been shooting, the conversation has just gotten a bit more diverse, which is great. And we're covering some great women's empowerment issues which is our leadership section. But the common theme with every interview is a story of great triumph. So even if I'm interviewing an entrepreneur who now is, I just interviewed a girl who took three companies public, she lived in her car and it wasn't always rosy. So I love to cover those feel-good stories. Oh, those are the stories I love the most, which is in many of our cases, as far as recovering addicts goes, so many of them, you know, started out sleeping in their cars. So (laughs) exactly. (laughs) And you know what? Everybody has a story. So it's not always what it looks on the outside. And I like to share those truths. I love it. I love it. So real quick then, how do you maintain, because based on your podcast, how do you personally maintain your spiritual condition, that conscious contact with a higher power? Yeah, well, I do that through consistently praying, prayer every day. I do gratitude exercises, and usually before I go to sleep, reading the word, reading great books. I am involved in a church community, so I, um, I'll i be going there this evening. So I really like to get myself involved with a very positive community. And I also, one last thing I want to share about that is I have this thing that um, my boyfriend created and, uh, well, we created it together, but he printed them out so beautifully and laminated them for me. And they are a personal code of conduct. And every day I read my personal code of conduct and um, I try to live by those principles. So it's a good gauge to keep me uh, in alignment. Well, it it sounds very similar to... When we get into recovery, there's these spiritual principles, these values, principles that we adopt that Mm -hmm. for us to be able to make that radical change from the behaviors that we had that always led us into drug abuse and alcohol abuse. It was those new values and principles that we held ourselves to that started to lead us towards that, you know, a much more uh, spiritual and much more enlightened way of being, which ultimately shifted our behavior. Is that kind of similar to what you were practicing? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So we're in alignment there. There's some alignment there. I can see that. (laughs) Now, we've got a treat today, folks, because Tara is not an addict, but she is the daughter of, I think both your parents are addicts? Or is it just your dad? They're both addicts. Um, Both. Okay. So we're going to dive into Tara's story and just get an idea of what it was like as a child growing up in a family for our listeners, you know, potentially what we could put our own children through if we don't find the way out of this horrific disease we call addiction. So Tara, let's jump right in. Let's talk a little bit about what it was like as a child growing up the daughter of drug addicts. Yeah. So let me, I have an interesting story because most of my life, I wasn't really aware of what was going on. So as a child, my parents were divorced. It seemed to me that my father didn't have any problems at all. He didn't drink much. He just smoked cigarettes. So I didn't think anything of it. But my mother did struggle with alcoholism. And I I think it was around 12 years old when I started to go to Al-Anon. Okay. So I started to go to Al-Anon when I was about 12 and my mother did stop drinking. And I remember being very involved in uh, the community at that time for a few years. And then my mother stopped getting so involved. She didn't go to the meetings as much. And she seemed to be, you know, drug free, alcohol free. At that time, when I was about 12 years old, the only thing that I knew that my mother had an issue with was alcohol. And I also knew that that was something that ran in my family. So it wasn't a big surprise. I had other aunts and uncles who had had the same um, struggle. But really what happened was later in life. But what I will say is that growing up in this environment, it left a bit of an imprint on me just by seeing your parents not really taking care of themselves. We are sponges as children. And I didn't realize this until much later in life and after quite some time in therapy that I had some real issues with self-worth, self-love. Although I wasn't an addict, 
I had real issues, some root issues that I think that most addicts struggle with. And I really had no self-love and self-worth. Fast forwarding to my 20s, that was when I first realized that my father had an addiction to crack cocaine. I found this out through his ex-wife, his second ex-wife. This was something that no one in the family saw coming. And I hate to say this, but I guess I was just really blinded. I thought that I really had like this picture perfect type of family at that point. Even though my parents were divorced, they were friends. I just didn't see this coming. So I guess I was around 25 when I first had gotten my father into rehab. That's when it got really bad. My mother was alive at that time and she didn't seem to have any issues that I knew of. She was drinking alcohol again, but it didn't seem like it had become an issue. So my father um, was really struggling. My mother was really helping me quite a bit with trying to get him into some treatment. And I learned a lot about some of the issues that my father was struggling with. He was labeled as bipolar or mental illness or whatever you want to call it. He was definitely an addict who was smoking crack and it was changing the chemicals in his brain. So... He did go to rehab and he was probably clean and sober for about a year and a half. And then he had relapsed. But also around that time, my mother was planning to retire and she was breaking up with her fiance at the time. And I guess it was bringing up some old wounds and um, she was in therapy and she was prescribed some prescription pills. So she had been taking those pills. I didn't know for how long. I did find out that this was probably going on for many years before I knew, but I was aware in my mid-20s and she got addicted to taking these pills and was doing prescription cocktails and definitely mixing the alcohol at that point. So I guess I was around 25, 26 now and I realized, wow, she has an issue. She's my father has this issue with crack cocaine. He's on and off. And my mother is definitely abusing alcohol and definitely, definitely abusing the pills. So real quick, these pills, yeah. were they antidepressant? Were they what was the purpose of the pills? Um, they were a little bit of everything. So she was on an antidepressant. She was on the Wellbutrin. She mm-hmm. was on painkillers. She was on Xanax, mm, yeah, I was gonna ask. Vicodins, mm-hmm. Darvon, and ultimately what led to her passing on an accidental overdose um, was um, introducing Chantex into her system. And I always like to say this because I think it's important when you're abusing pills for a long period of time, there's a lot of damage that's happening internally. And um, it was that last addition to this prescription cocktail mix that actually did end up taking her life. So your mother OD'd? Yes. Oh, man. Yes. So she OD'd. I was 27 at the time. I was aware that there was an issue, like I said, for those past two years. But she had said, you know, she was fine and she was going to therapy and that she was working things out. And then before I knew it, I got a phone call that she was dead. So I say this and I share this story only because I think that people are playing with fire quite a bit. And I know that she did have an addictive personality, which led to, um, you know, her negligently taking these pills. So fast forward, I'm now in my 30s. And uh, throughout this entire time, my father has continued to use crack cocaine And I've witnessed him deteriorate in his health, mental health, emotional health, physical health. And now it has gotten to the point where I have no longer have any contact with him because we don't know where he is. So uh, about a year and a half ago was the last time I saw him. And that was the last time I saw him and no one in the family knows where he is. We are led to believe that he is alive because there was some police activity that we were made aware of. And my cousin had ran into him randomly about five months ago. 
But I will say, and, and I say this just because I want this to be an open forum for family members who are listening or even for addicts who, you know, if they just think about what it does to their families. I mean, I live every day now not knowing whether or not he's alive or if I will ever know if he has passed. Yeah. Okay. So that is just, that brings you to um, today. To today. So got lots of questions. <laughs> yeah, please shoot, fire away. <laughs> um, it's very heavy. And most of the time it's listening to the other side, which is the family member, the parent, the, the father, the mother talking about how difficult it was for them to stop all this, this behavior that they knew inherently was affecting their family. At 12 years old, you started doing Al-Anon. Now that's very young to be introduced to already a 12-step program. When you yourself aren't the one that's uh, suffering from this disease, what was it? Was it because of your mother? Was it because of your father? What was it that prompted you to actually seek Al-Anon? It was actually my mother. My mother was advised that it would be a good thing for the kids to go. So she had suggested it. And how long were you part of the Al-Anon Fellowship? Did you ever become a part of the fellowship or were you just mostly, did you make a couple of meetings or how was, how effective was that for you in your life at that time? You know, I would say that I was engaged in the fellowship for probably three years. I was going, most of the times I went was when my mother had to go and I was with her. So I wasn't with a friend or I wasn't with anyone else. And she would say, would you go down to the meetings? And I thought, okay, sure. Plus I always was very interested in personal development. So I kind of liked going and talking to people, but to be honest, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure that it was planting the seeds for the future, but I'm, I don't see the direct correlation. I didn't see it at the time. I started seeing a therapist when I was about 15, which was probably the most helpful that I remember. Okay. Again, the reason why I'm asking all these questions is because it's important for, because I do have listeners that are not actual addicts. They are either the mothers of addicts or the children Mm -hmm. of addicts. So they need to know what, you know, what has worked for others. Um, For those of you, I'll have it in the show notes, uh, Tara's podcast it's very inspirational. It's one of those really feel-good podcasts with a lot of really solid information about how to better your life, how to be a better person, and um, through different verticals and different channels. And you know, this is coming from a child where there was a lot of emotional abuse, uh, basically based on all of the addiction that was going on around her. So there's, so for you, there's this at some point. You know, you're taking all this information, you're compiling this information consciously and subconsciously as you go from 12 years old to 15 years old and then up until your 20s. So for the most part, you were, I guess, a little bit aloof or maybe in denial about what was going on with your parents up until you were about, looks like 25, correct? Yeah, I guess I was unconscious to it all, you know? I would say it just wasn't something that I thought this was normal. You know, when you're raised that way, you think that this is normal. You don't think that this is abnormal until you get out to the real world and you start meeting really healthy people right? who don't have these issues. And then all of a sudden you say, oh, wow, wow, I've got some stuff to clean yeah. up here. So I guess I was completely oblivious right. to the severity of my situation until I got older, until I had some wisdom behind me. Right. Now, at 25 years old, you said uh, you took your dad to rehab. Now, some things led up to that. It wasn't like, I'm sure you didn't get a phone call and your dad's like, listen, I'm addicted to crack. I need you to take me to rehab. Uh, So what is the story that led up to this, ultimately, you taking your father to rehab? Well, what led up was just, you know, years of not showing up. So he would just worry us, you know, he would go missing for long periods of time. Him and his second wife had split up. So he was alone. So we were really concerned. His behavior was erratic. You know, he would call and say one thing and then do another. And ultimately it was really the strength of my mother who said, you know, we have to stand together and do something. 
And she really was the rock <laughs> that and the glue that pulled it all together. And we came together as a family. And even though they were divorced and we had asked him to go. So it was like an intervention. Oh, yeah. We had an intervention and uh, we had hired someone to come and to take him. Now, have you ever watched that show Intervention? Yes, I have. Is it anything remotely? Is there anything reminiscent to that? Or would you feel like that's more of the show itself doesn't really do justice to a true intervention? No, I mean, I've watched that show a bunch of times. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty truthful. I mean, what you do is you come together with a loved one and you hopefully bring a third party so they can actually take them right then and there. I think that is the key is that the addict has to go right then and there. You can't really wait. We found that after my father did get home from rehab and then when I tried to get him to go back after he relapsed, it was the same thing. Oh, okay, I'll go, I'll go. And then never ended up going. So you really do need that third party, the mediator there. I found it was super helpful. Um, so they could just take the addict with them. Right. And this, of course, and your mom is part of this whole, do you have brothers and sisters? I do. I have a sister. Okay. So it was your mom, your sister, you, and this third party. And my grandmother and my aunt okay. and um, my father. Yeah. That, and yeah. third party. That's a big group. Okay. So I can understand where, I guess the intensity of having that many people together kind of brings home the reality or the severity of where he was at at that time, which I guess prompted him to go to rehab, correct? Yeah. Well, what happened was, is I actually was leading most of the intervention and then I had the third party arrive so they could take him. Mm. So it was more of like a, it was like a third party transportation that I ended up having that time. Yeah. And what was your, your father's demeanor during the whole process? Very nervous, very sad. What was interesting is that my father always felt very close to my mother and I, where he could share a lot with us. So he asked me to step outside and, um, you know, away from the family. And, you know, he broke down and said, yes, I have a problem and I do want to go. And I said, well, you know, why can't you say this? And he just couldn't say it in front of the rest of the family. And I said, okay, that's fine. I'll make the arrangements and someone will be here to get you, you know? So I had already pre-planned all that, but I said, you know, someone will be here and we're here to support you. So yeah, unfortunately it wasn't long enough. Right. He didn't go long enough. And I, I guess what's so impressive here is that you know, your mother was so involved in this particular process and then gets so heavily involved and addicted to these prescription pills. So now you said also, if I'm not mistaken, you were 25 when you found out about your mom's prescription pills as well, right? Yeah, it was just around that time, 25 going into 26, I realized the severity because she passed when I was 27. So I was just around that time starting to see some signs that mm -hmm. there was an issue. What's really interesting, and I want to say this, is that a lot of people don't think it's a big deal because their doctor has prescribed them the medicine. Mm -hmm. And I was one of those daughters, and I thought, okay, well, if the doctor gave it to her, then I guess it's okay. Right. And, and I would ask her, you know, do they know the other things that you're on? And she would say, oh, of course. You have to disclose all of that information. So then I thought, okay, well, she's under a doctor's care. All right. Well, okay. It's not that big of a deal. And so that's a huge problem as well, because we doctors, a lot of doctors don't even know when there's new drugs on the market, they're not even sure how it's going to affect the body and how it will be mixed. And there's a lot of fine print. Certain things cannot be mixed with other things. So if you have a bunch of different pills in your system, it just takes that one new addition to take you over the edge. Yep, yep. And actually, just recently, more than ever, there has been a huge awareness over the media as far as prescription drug abuses. The amount of overdoses due to Oxycontin oh, overdoses yeah. is is staggering. So it's gotten to oh, the yeah. point where, you know, I think you and I are 
Are you in your 30s now? Yes. Okay. So I'm in my 40s. You're in your 30s. But, you know, I remember as a child as well, whatever the doctor gave you, you know, that's like God. Okay, I know. So God yeah. gives me, you know, the, here's your prescription. I go down, I get my prescription, I fill it out, I take it, no questions asked. Whether it was me, whether it was you, whether it was our parents, the only problem being that there's no consideration for people that are addicts. And the way that we were, like, for example, alcohol is legal. You can walk into a bar today, have a couple of drinks with your friends and leave and have a good night and tomorrow tell a story of you know of how it was the night before i walk into a bar have a couple of drinks all right i promise you i won't remember what happened the next day or how much i drank because the allergy kicks in and i can't stop i know that now Mm -hmm. but you know turning 21 years old and now i have i'm legally of, of age to drink you know i have no idea what i'm up against if i'm an alcoholic or an addict so the same thing with these prescription drugs so yes there is I guess the point I'm trying to bring across here is that today is not like it was when we were growing up as kids. There's a lot more awareness as to actually the imperfection or the the imprecise way of measuring whether or not a prescription drug will or will not affect someone, you know, to a point where it could actually take their lives. And I think a lot yeah. more awareness is coming. So that's actually a plus. It's a little late for for some of us, that's too late in the equation for your mom, but it's not something that people are taking lightly anymore. And, and it's good that we're bringing these. The more we bring it to light, the more it's on a podcast. You know, I have a few thousand people that listen to this podcast, so they're going to hear this. Uh, maybe mm-hmm. your listeners will listen to this. So it's always important to recognize that it's you can't go blindly following what a doctor is going to tell you these days. You have to do a little bit more due diligence. Yeah. And I just want to add to that. I'm in a very strange position because I have two parents that were um, at the different ends of the spectrum. So a father who ended up getting addicted to a street drug, whereas my mother was, you know, a very high powered, busy professional that you wouldn't at all think that drugs or addiction would be a problem. And she ended up getting, you know, having her life being taken by the pills. So I, I looked at my life after I lost my mom and I said, wow, this is really interesting. You know, I've got the father who's on this end, the mother is on this end, but it's still the same issue. Wow. I've got to make sure that I don't, you know, I have yeah. to make sure that I have to be very, very, very careful with all the choices that I make because you know, it's a slippery slope. To be honest with you, you never know until you've crossed that line and then there's no way of going back. But having the awareness that you have, you know, I I will tell you one thing is for sure. My daughter is 12 years old. She's never seen me drink or use or anything like that. And she knows why uh, her mother and I are divorced. And so she's got that whole premise. And it wasn't like anything where I made a conscious decision to constantly be bombarding her with information about the dangers of drugs and alcohol. She's the kind of kid that is a good kid, has no inclination towards drinking or smoking, hates when people are smoking around her. She's just this very well-structured young woman. And so I'm hoping that maybe It's the way my behavior is. And I also, when I talk about it, I say, hey, alcohol is the reason why your mother and I are divorced. You know, so there's a very strong message that I gave to her that it was that, you know, your dad is an alcoholic. He can't drink. And that's why we're not married. And that could have something to do with it. I don't know. I I would hope that it does. But I certainly don't like to put too much emphasis on it because I want her to be able to make her own choices. But I think that your awareness of it is so important because if you are an addict, once you start, the clock starts ticking on you. All right. And it's only a matter of time before you end up, you know, in a spot where it's not yeah. cool. It's not cool. <laughs> you know, I drink not very often. There's been times, though, where I've definitely, especially when after I lost my mom, where I was very depressed and I was definitely drinking and using drugs. And by the grace of God, I caught myself before it got bad. I really, really just wanted to not end up like them. So I really made a commitment to myself that I would really check in and I do, and I check in every day and I check in every week. And, you know, when I'm feeling like, okay, like a couple of weeks ago, I'd gone out and I had a couple glasses of wine and even just having someone fill up your wine at dinner and you're not conscious of how many wines you're having. I'm like, no, <laughs> 
waiter, do not do that. I need to know exactly what I've had. You shall not fill up my wine unless I ask. He's like, (laughs) okay. (laughs) I mean, I've gotten to that point now, which is a good thing because I do, like I said, I do want to be able to enjoy my life if it's in moderation. Yes, I agree. And which is a good segue. You know, we've covered a lot about uh, your parents and you know, what I'd like to know is a little bit more about you and just how, because there's, it looks like there was about a 10 year span of time where you've been dealing with this and it was made very clear and very evident that your father's a drug addict, all the things that you've had to deal with. uh, Then you found out about your mother, then your mother passing. What did you do? Because I'm sure at some point it was starting to affect you physically, emotionally, mentally. There was moments where you were depressed. You know, what was it that you did that protected you from all this dysfunction, all this chaos, and ultimately helped you propel and kind of use that energy to become, you know, the successful woman that you are? So, yeah, it's kind of a long story because it didn't happen overnight. It took about seven years I hope you're not going to figure out my age now. (laughs) You said 30s. We'll leave it there. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. So let's stop throwing numbers around. But after my mother passed away, I really struggled with my personal, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual health. Just put it that way. I was in a very bad place for about two years. And... It just, everything had just come to a head at that point. And it was just too much to handle. I just couldn't believe my father had then relapsed after my mom died. And he hasn't, since my mother passed, he has never gotten well. So this has been the last seven years strong. So after that, I just was like, okay. And then when my father then went back to using drugs, I was like, wow, okay. I don't have any parents. It's just my sister and I, wow, I just looked at my life and it looked pretty dark. I'd lost a lot of weight. I was suicidal. I was just really lost my appetite for life. And about a year and a half, two years into that, by the grace of God, I had some great people in my life who really loved me and supported me and, you know, saw me struggling and reached out and said, can I help? And I mean, during that time, that two years, I was going to therapy um, and working through some things, but I had gotten involved with an amazing community that was led by a church. And I really had support and I prayer and just revelation on who I wanted to be and who I didn't want to be. And things started slowly to look better. And I just continued to stay consistent. And I read every book I could. I went back to school to study nutrition and wanted to learn about how to heal my body naturally so I would never have to take pills, how to prevent illness and disease by eating plant based foods. So I kind of went on a health kick (laughs) Um, and that was great because it was exactly what I needed. Yes. I guess my personality is a little bit like a pendulum. It's pretty intense. So it was pretty low and then started to move pretty positive. And I started going to school and feeling better and getting back to those things that I love. I was an actress too before all this. I was acting before my mother died for about seven years. And then after I had my little mini breakdown, I stopped acting and it took a while, but I started getting back into media, started to, you know, think about what my passions were. That's where Divine Lifestyles was birthed really was through that whole transformational time that I had. And it took, I mean, we're talking it's seven years later. So, I mean, it took still happening, right? I'm still working on everything. It, it's always a journey. But I would say things started to really look better the more consistent I got with going to school, taking care of myself, and distancing myself from my dysfunctional family members. And so I just want to see if I can get you to go back to that moment. You know, you were suicidal. Yeah, all this stuff was going on around you. You were really, you know, underweight. And 
for many of us, there's that point in our lives where we go, you know, for me, it was I'm either going to reach across and grab the nine millimeter that's in my dresser drawer and blow my brains out, you know, or I'm going to get to that meeting that somebody suggested I go to. It was one of my white light aha moments. So Mm -hmm. what was that moment like? Can you tell us exactly when the light bulb went on and you knew that if you didn't make a left, you know, no, actually, if you didn't make a right, (laughs) you were going to make a hard left. Yeah. Well, I would say, I can't remember. I have two little moments, but a little moment than a bigger moment, but I can't remember if it was in the same day or if it was in the same week, but I was walking across the street one day and I was so negative and so low that I just walked across the street without looking both ways. And I thought this was where my head was at. If I get hit, it was meant to be like, I live in New York city. It's probably a good chance that I'll get hit. Yeah. But I didn't, but that's what I thought. I'm not going to look both ways. Meanwhile, there's buses, there's Mm -hmm, everything, mm -hmm, bike mm -hmm. people on bikes, cars, and other people walking. And I just thought, well, I'm going to just cross without looking. And that's when I realized, ooh, this is pretty bad. So then I can't remember if it was the same day or night or or that week, but that I was very, very low and I was very down. And I remember I was on the floor of my New York City apartment and I was crying and I was just like, oh my God, I just can't take this pain. Just the pain, the hole that I felt inside of me didn't feel like it one person could bear that much pain. I just didn't think that I said, I'm not even old enough to have this much pain. Like, what is this? This is like a never ending hole of darkness that I feel like retching my soul. And I just was crying to God, universe, anything. I was just like, listen, I need some help and I need it quick because at that point I didn't think I'd even make it through the night. I didn't know what I was going to happen, but I just, I was on the floor, just like, I'm not going to make it through the night. And I mean, I didn't have a a plan or anything. I didn't have a plan. Like I'm going to take pills. I'm going to do this. But I was so reckless already that I just knew that, okay. And I was just screaming out, God, universe, whoever you are, I don't even care. I just need, need, need your help. And I need it right now. And I was crying. I was on the floor and I just felt, you know, a few minutes later, I felt like, I guess it was like this warm, peaceful sensation kind of around me. And I didn't feel so much pain anymore. It was like the pain had been lifted. And I was like, whoa, what is that? You know, my gosh, is that literally the grace of God? What is that? Is that an angel? Is that my mom? Like, I didn't know what was happening, but it was really an outer body spiritual experience. And I said, okay, well, whatever this is, let me keep pressing into this. So I just prayed and prayed and prayed. And I was raised Catholic and I wasn't Catholic anymore, but So what I knew to do was to go over and, okay, let me read my Bible or let me call someone that, you know, has a church and tell them what I've been feeling. So I did. So I read my Bible and I felt better. And then I made a phone call to a friend of mine who was involved with the church. And I said, I think I really need to do something more than I'm doing. I'm in therapy. I mean, I was getting hypnotized at that time. Like nothing is working and I'm really scared. And he said, sure, you know, we'd love to have you. And I started really getting more involved with um, a community of people that I really trusted. And um, slowly but surely, things just got better. Oh, man. I started tearing up. I got goosebumps. And (laughs) I was so impacted by your story. And this, you know, not for nothing. I try not to be like a sensationalist news writer, (laughs) you know, but these stories, this is what people want to hear. They need to hear this. You know, this is the, the, those aha moments that are so impactful in our lives and so, and where we have nowhere else to go and we're so afraid and you just ask for help to the universe, to your higher power, to God, to wherever that may be. And you pray so hard and so strong with so much belief 
Yeah. And it comes and it comes. Yep. You know, there's so many people that that reject the idea of connecting with a higher power. So, you know, in our fellowship, we really try and accommodate all beliefs because it, they're very much opposed to the idea of connecting. And this is it, man. There's no difference between your story and your aha moment than those of us who ultimately recovered. It was that moment where we were so desperate and almost wished for death and mm -hmm. prayed for this help. And I could so relate with the pain. You know what mm -hmm. you were talking about? Like so you were in so much pain thinking to yourself, how could one person be in so much pain? Yeah. And that's what those of us go through. And so it, it's so reminiscent. We're just human beings. We're all just people imperfect. And when these situations happen to us, at least for me, I know that I need to reach upstairs. I need to ask my higher yeah. power because yeah. if I can't do it, I know he can. And I'll tell you, and I'm not even speaking religiously. I'm speaking spiritually, you know, by the grace of God, I am here today to tell this story by the grace of God. I am here stronger than ever. And I do have to give credit where credit is due. <laughs> I certainly couldn't have done it on my own. Oh, that's, I haven't said it in the whole interview, but I've always said HP, baby. That's always been, my, <laughs> that's always been my little slogan because it was very hard for me to adopt the God concept as well, but yeah. I could adopt the higher power concept. And I remember when I really, when my life started to make huge changes and I could feel these changes, I was like, it's gotta be a higher power that's doing this, man. And, and then it was like, you know, it was like HP, baby. I just felt that, you know, and yeah, so, so I call it HS, Holy Spirit. Yeah, <laughs> it, it works. It's amazing. So, wow, wow, Tara. OK, so listen. Whew, OK, we're going to start winding down here because I'm I'm all jacked up here. This is like, <laughs> this is awesome. I just love it. So listen, we're going to close up here because this is what we were looking for. This is what our listeners needed to hear. All right. That story, that aha moment about what you went through and how you persevered. So give us a couple of recommendations. First, give us some recommendations of some books that you would recommend to our listeners that you benefited from. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Amazing book. The Alchemist. It's another great book. Um, the Bible. It's another great book. The big book. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, you know what I have and you know what I'll do is I believe I have a list somewhere on my computer of like my favorite books and um, I can send that over to you and you can leave it in your show notes. We'll put those in there. I'll put yeah. those in there. Um, Pablo Coelho is one of my favorites. The Alchemist. I've read that yes. book probably four times. Victor Frankl's book is so powerful. It's oh uh, my god! Every so I, it's, powerful. It's a classic. Like yes. every human being needs to read it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you feel even the remote lack of gratitude in your life, read that book. It will change. You know, another one I just want to plug really quickly. It's actually my friend's book, and it has really changed my life. It's called The Miracle Morning. Hal right, Elrod. Right? How? How's my buddy? And I love his book and I live by his principles. I live by the miracle morning. I'm doing it myself. Awesome. <laughs> I love that you know how. I'm telling you. I oh. thought about interviewing him, but he, you know, he's not, he's, he certainly has one hell of a recovery story. Just I, the drugs. Um, I interviewed him. He's on my podcast. Yeah. Oh, I'm listening yeah. to it. Okay. I'm writing this yeah. down. How? He's a special, special man. So um, that's an amazing book as well. So yeah. Ugh, so much information, guys. So much information. So Tara, tell us, what is the best suggestion you have ever received? Oh, okay. Let go, let God. <laughs> yep. Really, something that I, I really like to live by, and I'm going to say it in my terms, but it is a scripture, and that is really like not trusting myself or leaning on my own understanding of things, because I think that when we do that as humans, <laughs> we can't help the human condition and our egos. So really to lean not to my own understanding, but to put my faith in God in something higher and outside of myself, 
because once I put my focus on the will, not of the will of myself, the will of what I'm here to do, what I'm called to do, I believe that my paths become clear, more straight, more honest, and more, you know, authentic. So that was something that I learned from my spiritual mentor. And it's something that I've really tried to make part of my code of conduct. It's beautiful. I love it. It's perfect. And, you know, it it doesn't matter. It can come from the scriptures. It can come, but that's the principles that we live by. You know, let God guide you through it. It's absolutely just as simple as that. So now, Tara, finally, if you could give our listeners only one suggestion, what would that be? There are limitless possibilities and our minds create these limited belief systems. And when you can really step out into faith and realize that you could live beyond your wildest dreams and that anything is possible, then you're really, you're onto something. So I want to tell people who are listening, like dreams do come true. Like you can have it all. You can do whatever it is that you set your mind to, no matter where you were born, where you live, what hand you were dealt, anything is possible. Oh, man, that's absolutely beautiful and 100 percent true. All right, Tara, please tell us all the listeners how they can find you, how they can get a hold of you, your website, whatever information you want to tell them so they can reach out to you. Yes. So you can go to my website, which is taramigalski.com. I also have a site, Divine Lifestyles, D-I-V-I-N-E, lifestyles with an S.com. I also have a podcast and that is Divine Lifestyles with Tara Migalski. So you can just go to my site and anyone can just reach out to me directly at Tara at DivineLifestyles.com. I love to hear from people in the community, so you can feel free to reach out to me directly. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Wow. Thank you, Tara. This has been Thank amazing. You. <laughs> Thank you. All right. We have now reached the end of our show. Thanks for joining us. And as we say here in Costa Rica, pura vida. Pura vida. Do you have some Latina in you? <laughs> that was perfect. No, but okay. See, <laughs> see, <Si>, Poppy. <laughs> oh, wow. Thank you for joining us on the Share Recovery Podcast. To check out the show notes page on this interview or to thank our guests for sharing their story, go to www.thesharepodcast.com. While you're on the website, don't forget to sign up for our free newsletter to stay up to date on the latest news, podcasts, and interviews. Want to be one of our guests and share your story? Then go to our website and click on the Share Your Story button. We share our inspiring recovery stories every Tuesday. So subscribe to our show on iTunes or Stitcher Radio to get your free weekly download. We'll see you then. The opinions shared on this show reflect those of the individual speaker and not of any 12-step fellowship as a whole. And though we discuss 12-step recovery and the impact it had in our lives, we do not promote or endorse any 12-step anonymous program.